In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. The epistle for the second Sunday of Advent is that of the Blessed Apostle Paul to the Romans. Brethren, what things soever were written, were written for our learning, that through patience and the comfort of the Scriptures we might have hope. Now the God of patience and of comfort grant you to be of one mind toward another, according to Jesus Christ, that with one mind and with one mouth you may glorify God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Wherefore receive one another as Christ has also, also hath received you, unto the honor of God. For I say that Christ Jesus was minister of the circumcision for the truth of God, to confirm the promises made unto the fathers, but that the Gentiles are to glorify God for his mercy, as it is written, Therefore will I confess to thee, O Lord, among the Gentiles, and will sing to thy name. And again he saith, Rejoice, ye Gentiles, but his people. And again, Praise the Lord, all ye Gentiles, and magnify him, all ye people. And again Isaiah said, saith, There shall be a root of Jesse, and he that shall rise up to rule the Gentiles, in him the Gentiles shall hope. Now the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that you may abound in hope and in the power of the Holy Ghost. And the continuation of the Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew. At that time when John had heard in prison the works of Christ, sending two of his disciples, he said to him, Art thou he that art to come, or do we look for another? And Jesus, making answer, said to them, Go and relate to John what you have heard and seen. The blind see, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead rise again, the poor have the gospel preached to them, and blessed is he that shall not be scandalized in me. And when they went their way, Jesus began to say to the multitudes concerning John, What went you out into the desert to see? A reed shaken with the wind? But what went you out to see? A man clothed in soft garments? Behold, they that are clothed in soft garments are in the houses of kings. But what went you out to see? A prophet? Yea, I tell you, and more than a prophet. For this is he of whom it is written, Behold, I send my angel before thy face, who shall prepare the way for thee. And thus far the words of the Holy Gospel. What went you out into the desert to see? Good question. What are we seeking during this season of Advent? Last Sunday I remarked that we can consider the whole season of Advent to be like a long night vigil. Keeping vigil in the darkness of the season and that we can benefit from the lighting of candles. <clears throat> lighting of candles, that candlelight is captivating. It can help us to it can help us if we have distracting thoughts to focus our prayer on, on that candle, and especially a blessed candle, a sacramental. I know many of you have been bringing me candles to bless over the last many months, and I'm, I'm always happy to do so. So, if we consider then this season as a long vigil, what, um, what is our goal? Our, our goal really is to get to heaven, to get to paradise. Now Moses tells us that in the very beginning, the book of Genesis, the very, very beginning, God, the Lord God had planted a paradise, a paradise of pleasure, in the very, very beginning. And we refer to that as the Garden of Eden. Now the Hebrew word for paradise, pardes, uh, might be pronouncing that incorrectly. I didn't study Hebrew, I studied Latin. 
But the Hebrew word for paradise, I'm guessing pardes, is a borrowed word from the Old Persian, pairi daesa, which designates an extensive park enclosed by a wall attached to the royal palace, and the park would be planted with trees and grass, watered by natural streams or channels which were diverted into pools and sometimes stocked with game. So we think about that, we think about a royal palace in Persia with the resources to build this beautiful walled garden and it would resemble the Garden of Paradise. And it can take a lot of money and a full-time staff to keep up such a thing. If you look at the garden out here, that is tended by me and once a week by uh, a part-time teenager for a couple of hours, you'll see just how neglectful, uh, how neglected this garden is. But we can imagine a garden of paradise. And paradise then is contrasted with the wilderness or the desert. Now, if from the beginning paradise was created, it is evident that the whole world was not paradise. We learn that God formed man from the dust, and then he placed man whom he had formed into paradise. So there is, there is paradise in the beginning, but there's also a place that is not paradise. Now after the man Adam had sinned, the Lord God then sent him out of the paradise of pleasure. He was cast out of the garden, and he was to till the earth from which he was taken. So Adam was created in the desert, or in the wilderness, placed into the garden of paradise, and then sent out of paradise back into the desert. And that is, uh, there's a pattern to that. We can see a similar pattern, although it points to something else, kind of. You can see a similar pattern at the altar during the Mass, where the altar missile starts on the epistle side of the, God, of the altar, and then it moves to the gospel side of the altar, and then it moves back at the end of Mass to the epistle side of the altar, whence, whence it came. And what does that mean? Well, you recall that our Lord revealed His Word to the chosen people in the beginning, and then when the Gospel was being proclaimed, it was proclaimed to the pagans in the north, and then in the end, as the Gentiles reject the Lord, He will go back to the Jews, and when the fullness of the Jews have accepted the faith, then that will signal the end of the world. So that's signified by the moving of the book in the Mass, and at the very end of the Mass that is moved back. Now we see a similar pattern with St. John the Baptist. St. John the Baptist, what do we know about him? What well, we hear about him in the Gospel today, we hear that he is in prison, but that he was in the desert. People went to the desert to find St. John the Baptist. Let's look back at the beginning of St. John the Baptist's life. As he is in the womb of his mother Elizabeth, now the archangel Gabriel had told Zechariah, his father, that this child would be sanctified in the womb of his mother. And we see that happen when the Blessed Virgin Mary, having also heard the words of the archangel Gabriel, after she is conceived by the Holy Ghost, she is sent to her cousin Elizabeth. And upon greeting Elizabeth, Elizabeth is filled with the Holy Spirit. The babe in the womb leaps for joy, and that is his sanctification. So then the womb of Elizabeth becomes like a garden of paradise, a cloister garden. Now, the, the, the early church fathers speak of the womb of the Blessed Virgin Mary, especially in the in the, uh, the hymnody this time of year, there's one particular hymn by St. Ambrose of Milan for Christmas that speaks about the womb of the Blessed Virgin Mary being like uh, a, a cloister, a cloister, uh, an illustrious cloister garden. So we think of paradise then in the womb. Now, why is it paradise? Because the Holy Spirit is there. The Holy Spirit has sanctified St. John the Baptist, and, in the case of Mary, that in her womb is God himself. Therefore, it is this wonderful cloister garden. So St. John the Baptist begins in this beautiful place, 
And if only that were the case for all of us. Because in the womb of every woman, we would say that it is a place of comfort for the child, but that child still needs to be baptized. St. John the Baptist alone received sanctifying grace in the womb. Now it is speculated also by more than one uh, church father, it's possible that St. Joseph also was sanctified in the womb and born immaculate, but not conceived immaculate. Blessed Virgin Mary alone is conceived immaculate. But St. John the Baptist is born immaculate and speculate by, and it's up for debate whether St. Joseph was as well. We know from the scriptures that St. John the Baptist was born immaculate. So what happens when he's born? Well, he leaves that cloister garden. He is sent out into the wilderness. The angel Gabriel said that he would drink no wine or strong drink and that he would live a penitential life. What does the wilderness look like? Well, the book of Deuteronomy tells us Where is that? The book of Deuteronomy describes the desert as a great and terrible wilderness, wherein there was the serpent burning with his breath, and the scorpion, and the dipsus. The dipsus is a serpent whose bite causes a violent thirst, and no waters at all to be found in the wilderness, in the desert. So from the cloister garden, St. John the Baptist goes into the wilderness, and he lives his life there preparing the way for the Lord. And we know that after the Lord was baptized, the Holy Spirit drove him into the wilderness to fast and pray for 40 days. So we see a pattern here, because in the end we know that our Lord, uh, after descending into hell and preaching to the souls in prison there, ascended into the true paradise which is heaven, to claim his throne. So we see a pattern here. The Lord goes back to repair the damage that was done, to make all things right. There's another time when we can see that this happens, and this is when Mary and Joseph had to travel from Nazareth to Bethlehem. Now, I was privileged several years ago to be taken on a pilgrimage to the Holy Land in January, and it was still Christmas according to the, um, it was still Christmas according to the Armenians. We were there on Armenian Christmas. Now, in the Holy Land, Nazareth in the wintertime is like California. It's, 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 um, it's green, palm trees, and there's fruit on the trees, the, uh, the weather is mild in the winter, it's very nice. But Bethlehem is rocky and mountainous and cold, it's like high desert. And so Mary and Joseph traveled in the winter from that lush, fertile land that is green and, and mild, south to Bethlehem, where it's rocky and cold for the birth of our Lord. And then, furthermore, they were driven through the desert to Egypt. Now, Egypt, Archbishop Fulton Sheen mentions that this is a reverse exodus, that our Lord went back to the place where the chosen people had escaped slavery. Our Lord went back there to bless those who had enslaved his own people and to bring them the light of the gospel as well. So you see how our Lord uh, goes back to the beginning to make all things right. Maybe some of you have things in your past that need to be made right. Do not fear. Do not fear to allow the Lord to come into your soul, to come into your life, really, to come into your whole life and to make things right. There's no situation that does not have a solution. Even, as, even when things seem impossible, nothing is impossible for God. And I'm sure there are many people in this room who could tell stories of how God brought about 
the impossible and made things right. Have confidence in that. That is what God does. That is why He is God and we are not. We understand that there are some things that only He can do. And boy, are there many things in the world that we would like Him to do now. Which is why we need to keep praying. Let's get back to our story. The prophet Isaiah tells us, In the desert prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the wasteland a highway for our God. And then he says also, O people of Sion, behold, the Lord will come to save the nations. And the Lord will make the glory of his voice heard in the joy of your heart. Is there joy in your heart? Or is your heart a wasteland, a wilderness, without water, without love? We need to have joy in our hearts to really live a sweet and a holy life. That is what, that is what life is all about. And yet, yet, we are living in a wilderness. We are living in a wilderness. We all have problems, we all have disappointments, we all have suffering, but we don't have the suffering that others have. And with all the inconveniences and annoyances of this last year, we really need to count our blessings, because it could be worse. And maybe it'll get worse in the future, I don't know. But it's not so bad. It's not so bad. There are those with um, chronic pain. There are those with um, debilitating uh, conditions or diseases, or with terminal, terminal illness. There are those who have, uh, who are desolate, those who are desperate, those who are hopeless, those who are despairing, those who have a roof over their heads, those who don't know what the future brings. Give thanks for what you have. We don't have food shortages. We have electricity and heat. We have running water. We have many conveniences. Life's not that bad. And we should guard against grumbling. Grumbling is not good. It's not good for us. It doesn't lead to anything good. Be thankful for what you have. Now in this wilderness, perhaps we can follow the example of St. John the Baptist and choose the wilderness and find joy in the wilderness. Now that is what men and women do when they enter into the cloister, into religious life. And when we think about that joy of heart that the prophet Isaiah uh, announces, have you ever met a Carmelite nun? Probably not, because they are behind a grill. For a year, I was able to say a weekly Mass once a week for Carmelite nuns down in Eugene. And each week, I really looked forward to going there. There was a joy in that place that's indescribable. But if any of you have ever met a contemplative cloister religious, then you'll, you'll know what I'm speaking about. Now, I couldn't see the nuns because they were behind the grill, except when I went into the sacristy to prepare for Mass. Sister Sacristan would come to the, to the window and she would hand me my chalice and give me the intentions for the Mass. And here was this Carmelite nun that was so filled with joy, it, it radiated from her. And perhaps you've met, uh, perhaps you've met other religious Maybe you've met a monk who has chosen a life of silence, penance, work, prayer. And usually these people are, are peaceful presence. Peaceful presence, they're content, they're filled with joy. And you realize that there's something that they have that you want. You want that. You're not sure how to get it. Now, many of you have already chosen your vocation in life, and that's it. That's your vocation. If you're married, you have children, 
that's your vocation. Some of you are, uh, are still discerning your vocation. Or maybe you're in between things, in a time of transition. Nevertheless, each of us desires to go back to the beginning, to go back to paradise. We have a memory of some place we've never been, but we have our memory in our souls that God has planted, and we know that we want to go back there. Now, how do we get there? For some, it'll be a cloister. For some, it'll be religious life. For others, it'll be a life of service and work and a profession where you give yourselves to the betterment of society. For others of you, it'll be raising children, teaching them, forming them, struggling through married life, family life, and the, all the problems of the world that are on your shoulders. But we need a place of quiet to get away to. Whatever your vocation, you need a place of quiet, a place of peace to retreat to. Some of you might have an opportunity to go on a formal retreat. Others of you have to carve out times in your busy life. But here's where that time of family prayer can be a time of refuge. Yes, you're, uh, you're handling uh, wiggly little babies all the while. But by the lighting of a candle, simple thing like lighting of a candle, it, it brings a sense of peace and calm to a room. And it even calms the child, that captivating light in the darkness. Try to carve out some time during this Advent of just peace and quiet. And I know some of you are saying, oh, Father, that's easier said than done. But some of you know that you can do it very easily. And you've neglected to do so. This is the time. Use this time in long, cold, dark nights to light a candle, take out that dusty Bible from your bookshelf. You are Catholics after all. Open up the Gospel of St. Matthew, St. Luke, and get started. Have some time with the Lord and find that peace in your soul that you cannot gain for yourself. Only God can give it to you, and He wishes to give it to you. You just have to allow Him to do so. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen.